tell me your name and spell it, and if you have a title, tell me your title, okay? and then we'll ask you for questions. Okay, my name is Bart, standing out, Cartwright, B-A-R-T-O-N, S-T-A-N-D-I-N-G, E-L-K. Okay. And um, tell me uh, what powwow means to you. What, what is it? Powwow means to me is uh, an Indian, a lot of Indians gathering around to come have a social time, good time, and make new friends, make old, and meet old friends, meet, you know. And, uh, um, tell me about what you're wearing today. Well, well, what I'm wearing is a blue ribbon shirt, and uh, this breech cloth here is it's uh, Eastern Woodland. The design is a floral design. It is uh, it, see, it's depicting the, the 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 region where you're from. Usually, the the dancers put put on what their their uh, what depicts their their original homeland. And this is the significance of the Eastern Woodland people. And so you see uh, these, uh, like the, the people in the Midwest would be having a, a geometrical design. And uh, this is why, this is how they come about on how they make their designs and stuff. And what are the uh, bells? The bells are for uh, keeping rhythm with the drum. You always uh, try to hear your your own footsteps while you're with the drum, which is a very important part of the powwow. It's like the heartbeat. And tell me about the dance that you do and, and the competition that you have. Well, I, today I'm in a Southern Straight, a straight competition, because, uh, well, I want to get start getting into that. I'm really a traditional dancer, Northern traditional. Where the kind where they, you wear a bustle, a bustle of feathers on the back, on the back. And, uh, that's about it. Yeah. And uh, what, when, when in the competition that you're in, what are, what are we looking for? What are the judges looking for? How what are they are looking for is the, the profile and the profile and uh, the, the last last beat of the drum that your foot is supposed to stop on the on the ground, be on the ground when it stops right on time and look at the we also look at your movements how you present yourself I noticed yesterday you were using a, a, walking, a walking stick, stick. yeah well, uh, that? that's uh, like a, it was given to me for uh, it was a uh, prayer stick that's what it is a prayer stick and what it is uh, you have a um, the four four jingles that are carved in cedar. Is when you when when you jingle it, it means you're you know, sounding out a prayer. Well, it just uh, puts the uh, puts that spirit right into your what your mind is all about, and, you know, and what you, what you like to the Creator to bless and all this stuff. Right, right. That's the well, most unique part of it, you know. And what would you say to someone who's never been to a power before? What would you say to the They should come see the original American Indians here, the original inhabitants, because we all have a good time. We all, we're all one. We're all. We're all in that circle of life where we're all we're coming to have a good time. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to anyone out there if they're watching? Well, Wanishi. That means thank you in Delaware language. So Wanishi. Excellent. Okay, we want to get a uh, portrait shot of you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no. Uh, what was that called? I forgot. War that made a
America or yeah, no, the event that you were Okay. money to keep the programs running and it gives our people a chance to come out and enjoy themselves. It allows the different communities to get together and celebrate with one another. To recognize each other. Plus we can educate the public to the Native American way of life. You know, their traditions, their, their habits and, and etc. And instead of them just being wondering of what this, that or the other is about, they can actually be a part of it if they choose to. Your three chiefs coming together, what does that signify? What does that mean to the community? How, is this a common intent? You've got three chiefs at one powwow, and how do you guys work together? That's why I think it's a demonstration of the unity of our community. Wait, hold on, hold on one second. Can you get the, can you cut this, give the cable more slack so that it doesn't show? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, how's that? Sorry, hold on. Sorry. He wants to play with your leg now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to play with yours. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Okay. As Go I was saying, it. I think Go. it's a demonstration of the unity uh, of our community. Uh, well, I think it's nice when, when different tribes come together because the outside world is a force against you to start with. And you don't want to have that same division within yourself. So chances like this is a chance for each one of us and our tribes to, to demonstrate unity, work together, you know, for the common cause. And not only that, the, the three of us sitting here together, our people are looking for this. The people from the three different communities are saying that we are working together. That kind of makes it open up so that they work together. And it means a lot to have 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 to Black Horse Creek will be attached to Cup of South. We have the opportunity to see a show that we have in our video for the video. And we'll bring it back to you. We have a tribal center, which is, we're able to have that through a grant from the Delaware State Budget, which is actually a lot of funds out of the tribal center. We are aspirations are to have a tribal grounds at some point to own some property and put up a center, a community center very similar to what our customers are doing right now. So we're working to that end. They're a little bit ahead of us right now. Well, you have to think about the Nanakoks now. They've been established forever. Their community has always had a museum, has always had a school that was there originally. The things that we're patterning ourselves from are the things that we learned from them. And then we're still growing. We just had, in the last year, we just had 16 acres of ground donated to us. That's the first ground that is actually tribal ground, where the museum that was an old school that we used that we got from the state, where our center's at was the Manico Indian School that we got there, but this is the first ground. We've not said anything or not any ways of how we're going to use it right now, but at least we have got some ground now to establish ourselves better. 
so the three, three of you have been here over the past uh, almost uh, 48 hours, two days. Have you shared or planned or sort of talked about things that you're doing in common or, or figured out ways of supporting each other? Or, we, don't, we don't do that at the powwow. Ah, okay. That's, the, the powwow is not the place for business. If there's an emergency, yes, we'll handle emergencies, but we come here to have a good time. Okay. Now, when I, when I go to his powwow, he works. When, when he comes to mine, I work. We go to Dennis, he works. So it's about having a good time and fellowship. S-F-E-R-A-Z-O. Thank you very much for having us. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here with you. So what does the power mean to you as a spectator? Something comes to the power? I had mentioned to my partner before, I'm a 9-11 responder. I look at a white culture because I live in that social order. Our culture is a melting pot. And I come here, and now I'm part of your social structure, even if just for a limited time. And we are all, even this social structure, is a melting pot. Why I bring this up? is those people who responded to 9-11 was another melting pot. We came from all over. I was an iron worker 27 years and 11 months. The majority of the time I worked with Native American people. I was with the Mohawks. I liked my position and where I was placed. For me, I'm very involved in the outdoors and the beliefs from the earth. So to me, I don't feel like I'm far from home by being here. And I'm thankful that we were honored enough to be asked to be here. much of a culture shock it may be to you to go on vacation to another country. You should go on a culture shock to a powwow if you are an American to see where you real, where the original people, where their culture is really impressed upon you are you entering the reality of where these people have come from? Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Would you like to say? I would like to say to all the American, all the true American Native people, there are a lot of non-Native Americans who respect you care for your ways. I'm part Native American, so I don't include myself. But to, for myself and my partner to come from a city like New York, to look at our skyline and know that our skyline was built by Native American iron workers because your social structure includes climbing a ladder of authenticity. You become a higher elevated individual in your society by acquiring new tasks, accomplishments. People 
people don't realize who these structures were built by. So I want to say that even 9-11, as much as we think it was a black and white thing, I will vouch for the amount of Native American people that were there as respondents. And I went. Okay, so tell me your name and spell it for you, please. My name is Michael Arcari, A-R-C-A-R-I. And what brings you as an outsider to the show? Oh, what originally brought me was John, because I, he explained before, he's half Native American. And in, unfortunately, I guess for, for me and many of us, Native American culture doesn't really exist because of the hustle and bustle and what is required for us. And it's unfortunate because it's all artificial and we don't really get out and enjoy what we should do and pay respects to the Native Americans who really this is their country. So what, what do you get out of our, our what, 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 what is your uh, feeling being at the powwow? What, what do you get out of the powwow? For me it was more of a, let's say, a spiritual feeling to be able to get back to where we really should be. You know, learning what is important to us and forget about all those artificial goals that have been set. And to be able to Again, respect others, also the diversity, the differences in culture, but yet we're all the same in a lot of ways. And we need to be able to look past that difference and embrace it and say this is one people, one culture that we really need to be able to do to survive. Do you have an example of some of those uh, values that you, you, you that you get inspired with when you come here? And Go back to family, back to the the people that are most important to you. That a lot of times you don't give the time. You know, so much as being able to make a phone call and saying hello and saying I love you and and really honoring you know our elders the way we should. It seems that we put them away somewhere, away from us because they're in, we feel they're in the way, because we can't accomplish those goals. You have to have a nice house, you have to have, it's the old keep up with the Joneses. You need to have so many things and you have to be one up on somebody else. Forget that. This is what this brings you back to where, really what you should be, should be most important to you. Uh, and we, and we're guilty and I'm guilty of that. And it's, it's just the pressure that's put upon you and you feel that that's where you have to fit in. And in reality, no, that's not where you have to fit in. Where you need to fit in is here. You need to fit in and get that, your spiritual feelings back and really reorganize your life. Uh, what would you say to someone who's never been to a powwow or is thinking about coming? What would you say to entice them to come? I would tell them that it's, it's really a must for anybody to come because of, like I said, the feeling that I got to be able to tell them that you were able to take the time and being able to, in spirit, really refresh your spirit and to focus on what is important in the world and to try to forget those other, like I say, goals that are supposedly set that you must attain and really respect what you need to respect. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add? It's, as John said before, it's, it was really an honor to be here. Um, I had no idea that this is what was going to come over me. And I am so glad that we are here and plan to be back next year. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, we've been doing, like John said, a lot of... Okay, so tell me your name and spell it. And if there is a title, tell me your title. My name is John Norwood. Uh, N-O-R-W-O-O-D, and my title, well, I'm a pastor, and I'm also a councilman for the Nanticoke Lenape Indian Nation. Oh, we interviewed your daughter earlier. 
Yes. Excellent. Yes. So I, have, I have very some specific questions for you. I hope okay. You That's fine. So I'll start off with the generic one. Okay. 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 Generic, uh, what does the powwow mean to you, and what what is the purpose of the powwow? A powwow is a is a gathering of of native peoples. They typically are also open to the public. You have private powwows, but for our tribe, we call them gatherings. We don't call them powwows um, when it's mostly just for us and special invited guests. But a powwow is a way where we can celebrate who we are in the public eye with our friends and, and with people who are inquisitive. It's a way that we can remind people that we're still here because we're often forgotten. And uh, it's a way that we can also honor our ancestors. Uh, it, there are many, many generations that lived here whose stories are untold. And as we dance in this circle, we are re reliving and reactivating their memories, not only in our own hearts, but for everyone else to see. Um, what, so tell me, what, what, is your, what are your roles today? What, what did you do? Oh, well, today, today I uh, was the uh, worship leader for the worship service and also was the, the preacher for the service. Uh, our prayer ministry meets quarterly it's a tribal prayer ministry, but it's open to everyone. Matter of fact, on average, we have maybe uh, half of the people that are attending are tribal people, and the other half are, are friends of the tribe that, that come out and participate. Um, and uh, annually, we, we have started the tradition of actually running the worship service here on Sunday mornings. Um, they've always had a powwow worship service, but it just was turned over to our prayer ministry about two years ago. We gather, there is uh, the beginning of, of, of our powwow for the first hour, we do something that is not typically done at a powwow. We actually have our traditional uh, dances, the, the dances that are identified with our people um, that you don't see in pow in powwow dance. Powwow dance is uh, intertribal, it's pan-Indian, Indians from all across the country dance these dances, but each tribe and region has their own specific styles of dance, social dances, specific cultural dances and expressions. We do that also for the first hour of our powwow. We call it the, the Lenape dancing and we give people a glimpse of, of, of our traditional dances. And then we have what's called a grand entry where everybody comes in wearing the regalia of the style of dance that they wear for the powwow style dancing, which is pan-Indian. If you go to a powwow in Oklahoma or you know uh, elsewhere in the country, you'll see the same basic styles even there for powwow style. It's, it goes across the country. So it unifies us. Say more about it. So, the, the, so you open up the first hour and dance, and then what happens? Yeah, we open up the first first hour with our uh, Lenape style dancing, and then we have a grand entry, and everyone comes in with their various styles. We always follow our flags. There's an honor song uh, where we uh, have a, a song that actually is a flag song honoring the the, the history of our culture. Then we have. Um, and honoring of our veterans. Veterans are extremely important to us. We, we're a warrior culture. And uh, we honor not only the veterans that are native, but we honor all veterans, whether they are native or not. And they come into this circle, and uh, they have an opportunity to be honored in the circle and to march around the circle. Following that, we have the different styles of dance that are brought out uh, in turn to, to display themselves and to show what they, you know, the dancers to, to, to show what they have learned in their own techniques and to celebrate with their style of dance. And there are quite a few different styles for men and for women. Uh, and that's the essence, the essense of the powwow. At least the essence of the circle. We do a lot of eating. There's a lot of eating, there's a lot of spending money, especially eating. <laughs> I'm wearing the regalia of a straight dancer. Uh, there are two styles of traditional powwow dance. There's a northern style where the guys wear the big eagle feather bustles in the back. And then there's a southern uh, traditional style also known as a straight dance. And we don't wear a bustle, we wear a drop in the back. And we wear bandoliers. And, uh, but they are uh, warrior styles. One, is, one was generated, the straight dance was called the old man's dance or the gentleman's dance. And it was the style for uh, the, the elderly individuals. It's not quite as active as the northern traditional.
but we have all age ranges doing it now. Even my son is a straight dancer. Um, my youngest son is a straight dancer, and uh, he uh, he's out there, and he's he's only 13. I've seen I've seen straight dancers who are younger. I've seen them younger. Well, it, it comes together in as much as basic understanding of who God is, who our Creator is, spoke, is, 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 is proclaimed just in looking at what that Creator created. Creation speaks to us, and that's true in Native American spirituality, and it is also true in traditional Christianity, even though it is un overlooked. And, and I really think that in some senses, uh, it, it, is, it is the native perspective that, that uh, is able to delve into a basic understanding of what in scripture would, would uh, be uh, the way God reveals himself through nature. Theology calls it natural revelation. That God does reveal himself through nature. He speaks through nature. We can come to know his character. We can come to understand his creative genius and his glory through nature. And that is, that is the foundation of the, the spirituality of, of the Lenape and the Nantico people. Um, and with an understanding that we, we always believed in but one God, even though we were called pagans, which is absolutely wrong. We always believed in one God, one creator. We prayed to one God, one creator. It was extremely easy for us to accept Christianity because the concepts were, were similar in as much as that one creator also uh, uh, sent his son to die in our place. I referred to him in my sermon earlier as the mighty warrior. Well, he is. He is the mighty warrior for us. He's, he's, Jesus Christ is, is, is a, a savior of, of all humanity. And as we are a warrior culture, that was something that was very easily understood. That his battle was with the forces of evil. It was with the bonds of sin. So it's, it, it, it was an easy melding. By the mid-1800s, uh, it's documented that most of our people that were still here were Christianized. Um, and there were many who suffered because of their Christianization. When they were baptized, many ceased to be labeled as Indian because they had been baptized. And Indians were supposedly, according to our, our country's history, uncivilized. There were those who left in... In, um, with Moravian missionaries, and uh, there was a massacre that took that took place, uh, uh, and about 90 Indian Christian Indians were killed. Um, they they did not want to waste bullets on them, so they beat them to death. Uh, so our people embraced Christianity and even suffered because of it. A lot of people think that Indians, the Indians that became Christian, did so to kind of sell out and make life easy for them. That wasn't the case. It truly was a, it was a real heartfelt conversion experience that took place. The further west that uh, white America went, the more hostile the proclamation of the Christianity, the, the, the more, the more um, uh, uh, violent it became. It was not a true exp expression of the teachings of Jesus Christ. It became a way to conquer. And many of my brothers and sisters, the further west you go, are, are increasingly hostile to Christianity because of the way it was proclaimed to them. But they did, they, unfortunately, it wasn't the true faith that was being proclaimed because the true faith does not oppress. It liberates. So that's part of my ministry here, to reaffirm the fact that you can be Christian and Indian. You don't have to choose between the two. No, no, no. I know that there are some groups that say that. Uh, I, have, I, I have found nothing to remotely suggest that historically. Um, you know, the, the, there, there is that tradition among some, some European groups, but that's nothing that, that we believe. No. If you speak to tradition, a traditional Indian, they say, we've been here. We've been here. We've just been here. <laughs> okay, so, no, no. Yeah, well, the fact is we're still here. We're still expressing ourselves. This is a glimpse of our culture. It's not our culture in its entirety. 
We're engaging individuals. We want to share our culture. We want to teach our culture. We want to discuss it. And we want to do it ourselves. One of the one of the most awful things that happens to Native Americans is that there are so many non-natives that assume that, that to they presume to speak for us, sometimes speaking over us, and sometimes ignoring that we are that we're still in the room. So it's extremely important that if you want to have information about Indian education or what's happening, that the first thing you do is understand we're still here, we're not locked in the past, don't speak of us in past tense, we're still a thriving, growing culture, and if you want to know about us, come talk to us, because we'll gladly share it with you. Thank you. Thank you. Now i got to get out of this comfortable chair. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Lot slower than I was. I tell you. Oh, lot slower. Okay. Uh, tell us your name. Your, you spell it for us and uh, your title. Okay. My name is Yuri. U R I E Ridgeway. R I D G E W A Y. Um, I'm the tribal se secretary for Nana Cook and Lenape Indians in New Jersey. A couple of hotels I can't tell you. <laughs> so, start off with tell me what is the powwow and what is your role here at the powwow? Oh, my role here at the powwow? Um, well, I'm past powwow chairman. I've been I've been chairman for the powwow before, and um, uh, my role this year we're serving as host drum, and uh, I am just a, well, a fancy dancer. You know, uh, known as men's fancy, southern style, northern style, whatever. But, uh, I'm just a fancy dancer for the powwow. One of the performers. And what is a powwow? What is a powwow? A powwow is... It's a little of everything. A uh, powwow to me, is, it's, a, it's a social event, you know, where we get together and we... We share. We share a lot. You know, we go to powwow. Uh, yeah, we do it for the public to raise funds, but we also do it as, you know, um, a time to get together. The way I look at it, because... Um, I don't know, when we, like when I was in college, I was all by myself there. There wasn't many Native people there. And I couldn't wait to get to a powwow just so I could be around other Natives, you know. So this is just a time for us to get together, you know, and, uh, and, and share, and share, share with each other. And uh, so tell me about Fancy Dance, Men's Fancy Dance, and what is it? And talk about your outfit. Okay, Men's Fancy Dance. Now this is a story that was told to me. Um, it started in Oklahoma in the 1930s. It was told that the dance, the dance circles, our power circles and stuff, they got very small. Not many people wanted to participate. So a gentleman by the name of Gus McDonald, he um, took the old... Uh, the old uh, war dance that they did, that we used with the one bustle on their back, and he took the took that dance. He um, rather than use the eagle feathers or hawk feathers, he used chicken feathers, and he dyed on bright colors. And rather than one bustle, he wore two bustles on their back. And with that, he took some of the old war dance songs and he made them really fast. He made those songs really fast, and he taught those songs to his brothers. And so what he did was he presented that dance to the elders, and. When he presented that dance to the elders, they looked at that dance and they said, yeah, we think this may bring a new life to our circle. And that's exactly what it did. They said by the 19, you know, by 1940s, there was thousands of fancy dancers across the country. And by 1950, tens of thousands, you know, so they said it spread like wildfire. That's the story that was taught to me. And what is fancy dancing? Fancy dancing is, it's uh, energy. <laughs> that's all I can say about it. The faster you are, the flasher you are, the more moves you can make and still stay in time with the drum that you're competing against, who's trying to trick you and stops and starts and stuff, you know, if you can stay with them, the better you are, you know. And like I said, with fancy dance songs, they get, they get, uh, they get, you know, they'll be that fast or faster and you got to step in time with it. So, uh. It's 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 a pure energy. So the songs that the drummers are playing, you ha you don't know, and or do you know? Like, are they set I, or? I know we we don't know. I don't know the song that they're going to give me at that time. Well, like like today, what the dancers are doing, they're they're giving the adults the option to choose their drum in their contest. They get to choose their drum and they choose the style of song that they want, the style of dance they want to choose. Like Men's Fancy, you have 
you know, you can do a crow hop, you can still do a straight fancy dance song, or you can do a, a, a shake song, they call it. So you have those three choices of songs you can do, or just three choices of styles of dance you can do with, within the fancy. So they give you the option, but you don't know what song they're going to give you. Or, I mean, they have one song that starts, it's called a bullet, and it starts off, da -da 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 -da, and then it stops and goes into a shake. So, you know, you never know what you're going to get until, until you get out there. So you have to kind of Feel it. Um, just sometimes, you know, when you're dancing, you just you just connect with the songs. Sometimes you can go out and dance. I was dancing in Baltimore a few years ago. I hadn't danced in years. My first time dancing, and they gave me this one song, and I wasn't sure what song it was. Not that I heard it before. I'm sure I had, but it seemed like that song was meant for me. I hit every beat every time. But the next day, I was, <laughs> the song's going here and I'm going there, you know. So, it was just that one day, it was just, it was just, everything fell in place. I guess the moon and stars and planets lined up correctly for me. So. Tell me about what you're wearing in the outfit of Fancy Dancer. Uh, fancy Dancer, um, you have two bustles on your back. Uh, one on your lower back, one on your upper shoulders. That automatically defines you as a Fancy Dancer. Uh, we are wearing our porcupine roach, you know, with our... Our feathers are across the top. A lot of times I have rocker feathers that rock back and forth, or you can use spinners, the same as I have here. Um, in my hands, I got my whips. It, it was told to me, when you're out there, you want to look bigger than you actually are. Take up as much space, as much room, and just look as big as you can. Kind of like I'm going to make a peacock, you know? <laughs> He's out there trying to measure them, you know? They're taking up as much space and just look huge. And so that's what they always told me, you know, go out there and uh, take up a lot of space. So the whips and stuff going around, it makes me look a lot bigger than I actually am standing 5'2". Where do the moves come from? That you're doing? The moves? The moves you have, you have basic, you know, it still starts off with a basic one-two step, you know. Toe heel steps, what started our dancing out. But with fancy dancing, the nice thing about fancy dancing, it's freestyle. Anything goes in fancy dancing. You, you'll see us out there, we'll... Guys do cartwheels, they do splits, we do we do everything. When in fancy dancing, anything goes, anything can go. You'll see us jump in the in the air. You see us jump in the air and, and come back down and land and, and go into a spin and come back out and zigzag across the arena. You know, anything can happen in fancy dancing. And, and what are the judges looking for when they're watching? Okay. In fancy dancing, they're looking for your interpretation of the song. How you look to that song. You know, they say every song is different. Every song has a certain rhythm. Are you in rhythm with the song? Um, are you over, are you dancing faster than the song or slower than the song? The song has a certain, you should be going with that song. They're looking for that. They're looking for uniqueness. They're looking for the condition of your out, of your regalia that you're wearing. They're looking for if you're in time with the drum. These bells, they give away if you're out of sync. And they want you to nail the ends. When the drum stops, they want you to stop. You know, and, and so if you don't stop, it's pretty rough. Uh, the, I grew up how old is that? I'm dancing contest, and I stopped. The drum kept going. So I danced again, and I stopped again, and the drum kept going. So I went. Finally, I just gave up and started walking off. That's when the drum stopped. <laughs> so is there anything that, in closing that you'd like to say to anybody out there who has never been to a uh, powwow to entice them to come? It takes them to come. If you've never been to a powwow, a powwow is is I mean, you got you got you got to have experience one time, one time. And I would you know if you can get a chance, man, stay, stay until everything's done because um, you never know what's going to happen at any given time. Um, there's a lot of sometimes there's a lot of emotion that takes place. You know, like we did these giveaways. You know, everybody you never know when you're gonna when you're gonna receive something when you come to the powwows. But um, the one thing you can receive when you come here is you can see that us as native people, a we're still alive. You know, we're not just something that you're reading in history books anymore. Where it says, you know, especially with the native people in the east, they're saying, you know, when you read the final paragraphs, that there will not be people. They were once a great tribe. However, they no longer exist here on the east coast. They don't. They're still. They're moved away in Oklahoma. Well, that's not true. We still exist here. And so, first of all, you see that we still exist. And then by speaking to the people, speak to those native people, and you'll see that they exist right in your own neighborhoods. You know, they, they exist right around the corner from you. You go to school and we didn't even know it. And so, uh, 
and you're not going to know until you come out here to the to the, to the powwow. So, if you want to come out to the powwow, I would recommend everybody to come to a powwow. You know, at least at least once in their life, and I'm sure they'll be back again afterwards. So. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Okay, um, my name is Peppy, P-E-P-P-I, Eagle Wing, Highsmith, H-I-G-H-S-M-I-T-H. And so tell me, what does the powwow mean to you? What's a powwow? Uh, what is a powwow? A powwow is a coming together of different um, Native people uh, coming together to see the newborns, to talk about the old times, to enjoy the camaraderie of being around other people of native um, heritage and celebrating life and what you are part of. Um, it's very difficult being a, a Native American. It's uh, the type of thing that when I was coming up, you could be anything but Native American, and if you could blend in, blend in with uh, being Afro-American, you did so. If you could blend in with being white, you did so. Hispanic, you did so. Um, to get away from the persecution that was then and in certain areas still going on today. Can you talk a little, what was that like? Can you talk a little bit more? Because a lot of people may not know about that. Or it was like, um, from a youngster, I've always had my ears pierced. And I couldn't wear earrings, uh, like going to school or anything like that. I could only wear them at home, uh, around my family or uh, people who, who knew uh, my heritage. Um, I was raised in a mixed neighborhood, but still I couldn't say that I was Native American. I could say that I was black, I could say I was half black, something like that, but I couldn't say that I was Native American. What, what would happen if you said you were Native American? You were ridiculed. You were looked down on. Um, sometimes um, you were even put lower than, at the time, um, poor blacks. To be Native American, you were poorer than the poorest black. And I can remember many times my grandparents and my great-grandparents, I was fortunate enough to um, know several of them, uh, they would tell me I could do things in the house or around the house that I couldn't do in the street. And it was only certain uh, really close friends of mine that growing up knew that I was Native American. And, and they accepted me that way. But um, the old, old people were very cautious, very protective. Do you remember uh, when the first... Uh, um, Congress was put together in the United States. The, first, the nations were first established in, in the United States. In the 50s, I think it was? It was, was I, late 40s. Late 40s, early 50s. Mm -hmm. when they, 
Mm -hmm. How were you then? Do you remember? Was it, was it something that was talked about? You don't have to tell me exactly. But was it something that was talked about in your family? Do you remember? It was it? talked about in my family. Um, it was talked about mainly amongst the elders. There's a, a thing that um, children are to, are to be seen and not heard. So, like, if the elders were talking and they were something, you had to leave the room. You couldn't be in the same room with them. You had, uh, you had to go someplace else. If, if you had a, your room where you could go to and you could read a book or you could play a game, you could do that or go out in the backyard or go sit on the front step, you know, something like that, you know. But uh, other than that, you didn't sit around when, when the elders were talking. They didn't allow it. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if that was uh, because of city life or if that was just uh, the way they thought life should be in general, you know, and uh, it, it was instilled in me and I, I still do it today. I did it with, with my sons, I do it with my grandchildren, <laughs> you know. I, um, when the adults are talking, you're to be someplace else in earshot of us, you know. Um, and you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing, not something else, you know. Uh, uh. Hmm. So, um, so connect that to today and, and the powwow. How, what, what does the powwow do for you when you're here? And, and, and the pow, the powwow today connects me with my people. A lot, a lot of the people here in um, this area and at this powwow are distant relatives of my, of my they are cousins, first, second, and third cousins of my, my mother. You know, and um, I enjoy coming to these gatherings. I go to as many as I can, not as many as I used to, but I go to as many as I can now. And it's, um, it's a joy seeing the youngsters come up, seeing a lot of them who have developed into young men and women who have families of their own. Uh, they're kind of on the young side as far as I'm concerned, but you know, that's the way thing, things are these days. You know, young people like to have their children young, you know. Um, back in the old days, you, you were at least 25 or 30 before you would have a child. You may be married, but you couldn't have children growing in life. You would have children later on. So it's, um, that's a lot of uh, difference. Um, I enjoy seeing the um, powwow circle, the dance circle, um, trying to get back to the old ways, the old traditions, and they're teaching the young people the old traditions and the old ways. It's going to take a little time because you have all the modern conveniences now, the computers and the playstations and all like this, you know. But when you see young people, they want to come out and dance and spend the day out in the hot sun, you know, dancing and being in competition with one another, see whose steps are the better steps, and um, learning from one another and learning from the elders. It, it brightens your heart, it makes, it makes you feel good, it makes you happy. It's a great um, relief. Um, it's a burden off of my shoulders that I can now, and for the past uh, 30 some years, I've been able to say, yes, I am Native American. Yes, I am uh, Nanako Lenny and uh, Yes, I enjoy doing the things that elders did. Now, now I kind of understand some of the ways a little better. Uh, for a long time I wasn't in the dance circle, but then I came back and I'm happier now that I am back.